Thank you for coming out on this uh, cold, uh, wintry night. Um, so it was a couple of years ago, um, we've been doing this class for a while, maybe 10 years? Yeah, yeah something like that. Um, and we had a, the class that night over at the library, and I was lucky enough to have uh, a 60s pop icon. Um, her name was Leslie Gore. And um, I never thought I'd be here a class saying that one of the people that spoke with us in class here is no longer with us. So <clears throat> I'd like to dedicate um, the rest of the classes of this semester, the seminar, uh, in her honor and in her memory, because she came and, and really um, explained a lot about what it was like to be a pop star back in the 60s and uh, enlightened many of us to the fact that she really never saw much money because back then, um, when she signed to Mercury Records, her dad helped her do the deal and really didn't understand the fundamentals of the business. And she only got paid royalties many, many years later and not a significant amount. So uh, <coughs> she passed away yesterday, uh, two days ago. And um, any of you who know her music would be familiar with some of her songs. Whether it was It's My Party or Judy's Turn to Cry or something. So, um, and we also learned that 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 was really just the surface of those, those pop tunes, but her association with Quincy Jones, Jones and, and so on and so forth, and the, the legit legitimacy of her as a true great singer and an artist. Uh, you know, she wasn't boasting, but it came out that night how, how uh, fortunate she was and how fortunate we were to have her here. Right. And, and Quincy Jones still Last time he came up to Sirius XM, he talked about his girl, Leslie, and how you know, it was the first really mainstream pop thing he was, in, was involved with, um, and how much he adored her, adores her, and uh, how much fun he had working with her, and how she was still his, his gal, if you will. So um, I don't want to dwell on that, but I just thought I'd put that out there, give a little perspective for this semester. Um, <clears throat> so tonight, to kick off the series, I was very fortunate to uh, be connected <coughs> with this young woman who's with us. Um, <coughs> her name is Donna Eichmeyer, and um, she's one of those people behind the scenes. You're not going to see her on the front page of Billboard, perhaps, but she's the one <coughs> who's calling a lot of the shots um, and oversees the marketing uh, of, of many, if not all, of the Live Nation events in and around the tri-state area. Um, She's a lot of responsibilities, but I wanted to start off, rather than getting into the nuts and bolts of that, because um, I think it's always important for everybody to understand and know that she just didn't pop up one day and say, okay, I'm vice president here in Live Nation in New York City. There is a history of how she got here, and I always think that's important for you as you leave the hallowed halls here to understand what might happen and how, how it works to get um, to where you are today. And by the way, you'd be interested, uh, Dr. Marconi, that She's also a Newhouse grad. <laughs> of all things, I only learned that this evening. Another one. Here we go. Right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna sit down, and, and you you you're free to sit down, um, too. But I just thought maybe you could start um, <coughs> tell the class a little bit about um, how you started in the business and how you got where you are today. Sure. Um, I grew up in Schenectady, New York. Certainly not a hotbed for entertainment or anything else interesting. Um, but to your point earlier, you mentioned passion, and I think that if I had to pinpoint one thing that's important really for any job, any career, is passion because you spend a lot of time doing it, and if you don't feel passionate about it, it's a waste of everybody's time. I knew uh, in high school I thought it was journalism, and... I went to Syracuse and decided then it wasn't journalism but because I wanted to be a music writer and then it was going to be too complicated for me to be a music writer. So I switched to public relations um, but was involved in writing about music in college and then I went and interned at the Saratoga Performing Arts Center as a publicity writer for two summers and then went and worked at a PR firm which my primary account was the Saratoga Performing Arts Center and then I was hired from the PR firm to go and work at the PR, or to work at SPAC directly. I did that for, I think, nine years. 
Um, that was wonderful because growing up, I didn't really have a lot of exposure to the arts. So that was this, back was the summer home of the New York City Ballet, the Philadelphia Orchestra, the New York City Opera. I had absolutely no idea. So I had to just, I went and got books and I read everything that I could find. Um, I remember at one point, <clears throat> I was setting up uh, an interview with the timpani player for the Philadelphia Orchestra. And I walked in and I asked where he was and they said, well, over near the timpani. And I'm like, I had no, and then they just said the big drums over there. But it was a learning curve. I had to figure it out because I obviously lo already looked really stupid in that instance. But it was really just wanting to be there. The energy of the, the performance, whether it was a ballet performance, a concert, a jazz festival, a chamber music festival, it was all that excitement. So I dove in. I can't tell you how many books I read about from ballerinas. Um, I would be in the library reading about Bach and Beethoven just to understand what it was that made all of this work so well and how it was so amazing. Uh, and then Live Nation came in to Saratoga Performing Arts Center. We had promoted all the concerts, all the classical. Live Nation came in, it was SFX at the time, and took over all the concerts. So I ended up staying at SPAC for a couple of years and developed, actually worked with VH1 on Save the Music, with the Jazz Festival, um, built up some uh, student programs so college students could go see <clears throat> the orchestra and the ballet at a cheaper price and really tried to cultivate the arts in that regard because the difference between these one night shows and when you have a ballet or an orchestra residency, you really have to educate. If you like Dave Matthews, like Dave Matthews. If you're not sure, you have to try to sell the ballet or the orchestra more as an experience. You're not trying to get someone to become an expert in classical music. So it was a different kind of marketing, uh, definitely a more challenging marketing. But then I decided I missed the excitement of a sold out show because you don't really get those with classical, uh, certainly not in a 5,100 seat covered theater. And then I went to work for Live Nation and it started out with just the capital district. Then it quickly, I think after three months, moved to basically north of Manhattan. So <clears throat> I got stuck Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, Albany, Ithaca, Binghamton, um, sometimes Utica, doing all of Live Nation concerts there. It was probably about 80 to 90 shows a year with the primary focus being Saratoga Performing Arts Center and Darien Lake out near Buffalo in the summer. And then they called me to come to New York. <clears throat> and it quickly went from 80 to 90 shows to about 400 shows. And it, that was a, the, another learning curve in a different regard, um, balancing all those shows. And it went from under the radar to under the microscope. When the agent, the manager, the artist lives here and they're walking by and they want to know why they don't see a snipe or why they've listened to Z100 and they haven't heard anything about um, the show, it's constant pressure. Um, and definitely making sure that all your bases are covered because there are so many people here. And all it takes is one person to say, I saw the email blast and you know, uh, Bjork was listed fourth, why wasn't she listed first? So the whole level, the volume, the pressure totally changed. It's been a different experience all the way through, um, but obviously for the most part, um, a very fun experience. So when you started it, at, uh, I guess your first experience was at SPAC, so what, what experiences do you have <coughs> that you would relate to that were gender related as far as <coughs> being a woman in a business which is predominantly male dominated, although that is slowly changing. But I mean, along the way there had to be some, you know, because you're running around with in mostly a male environment, I would think it's back. It wasn't, but I never really felt it. I have to say, maybe it was the influence of New York City Ballet, where every, it's a lot of mostly female dancers. And a lot of the arts-based organizations really had a lot of women, and women in powerful positions. Um, as time went on, maybe it became really Live Nation, where it became a little more male-dominated. Um, I didn't really have, I never felt like it affected me in a negative way. Uh, that it held me back. You know, sometimes it can be a little dicey uh, backstage because you're a female. Ironically, it was never really with concerts. It was more with the classical. Uh, they run a little crazier, believe it or not. But 
uh, I never really felt I was at a disadvantage. And also, I think if you look at marketing and public relations in general, there's a lot of women. And, and at, when I was at SPAC, <clears throat> it was more PR-based than marketing-based, although there wasn't a, I was, it was one department. Uh, but I never really felt like I was at a disadvantage um, being a woman. And now, at working out of the New York headquarters of Live Nation, um, but I, I mean, there's a lot of women there. But I mean, I feel the male influence. Must more testosterone. Yes, is that on? The, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> yes, it is. It's definitely more. Um, you feel the the male influence and the, the male regard a little bit stronger uh, in the office. But a lot, the way that Live Nation works, and this will probably help explain the dynamic a little bit. So if there's, I don't know, 19 offices in the country, or maybe 26, or somewhere in that range. Um, and of, then we also have the headquarters in Los Angeles. They book, we have a lot of Live Nation tours. So LA will go and buy the whole tour. Say Kid Rock, for example, that's going on sale shortly. And then they figure out who, where the show is gonna route locally. Then that comes from, so we'll get the email, okay, Kid Rock's going to be at PNC Bank Art Center this date, and then we work to put together the marketing. There's not a lot of local interaction on the, the national tours. Mostly, actually, all of the marketers in Los Angeles are women. The two heads of marketing for the major agencies, William Morris and CAA, are women. So I don't, that's very female dominated. So I don't really feel, and, and it is, again, most, a lot of the marketers in the country, the VPs, well, it's probably half and half male to female. But there, I think, as it relates to marketing, there are a lot of females. When you go into booking, I think there are fewer females. That's probably more like 80% male. Um, so it's, the dynamic is, is very female based for marketing across the board. So you didn't, you don't feel, or didn't feel, um, being a woman <clears throat> was any sort of hindrance or handicap at any point in your career. No, I think I feel like if you had asked me this before I came to New York, I would say not. At, I don't feel any difference whatsoever. Being in New York and of the upper management in New York, um, there's only two women out of eight. So then if you, if it, like, there's a woman who runs PNC Bank Art Center as a, the general manager. She's one of, I think, three in the country. So that's more of an operations-based job, so you almost assume that it's going to be more male dominant. Um, but as, as it relates to the other VPs, um, I'm the only female, the other VPs. So I feel it a little bit more here. You know, upstate New York, I was more involved with the process of booking a show. So before it was booked, they would ask me my opinion. I had a lot of history in that, in those markets, so I would have input where, where I thought it would end up with attendance, what ticket prices should be, what the climate was for media. Um, here, I'm not involved that much involved in that process. And again, on a touring show, they don't really ask. Uh, it's more of the locally booked shows. So you know, it was, it was, it was a much smaller market, so there was a lot more interaction. Here, there's a lot of players. So let me ask you, how many of you guys have attended a Live Nation concert? OK, pretty much everyone. OK. Could you, not that you're a spokesperson, per se, for Live Nation, but could you just give us a brief thumbnail? Because <clears throat> you know, Live Nation is this monolith globally. But here, let's focus on the United States. I mean, um, they have um, several divisions, I think I, I figured out. they. Um, they have a concert division, a ticketing division, um, sponsorship. sponsorship and advertising division, and then I don't know if it's still active. The Artist Nation. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so they have still so they have those four key branches, um, and then <clears throat> how many of you would know this? But because I don't know if there's a House of Blues around here, I guess one in Atlantic City would be the closest one. But Live Nation has purchased and owns the House of Blues, and um, when you guys go buy a ticket. Um, not only to Live Nation events, but I think to a lot of events, there's a company called Ticketmaster, and that's also owned um, by the folks at Live Nation. And by the way, Live Nation is a publicly traded company that uh, 
should you want, you could investigate in it or invest in it. Um, but I wonder if you could just like talk a little bit about how, you know, because um, you mentioned there's national tours. So that comes probably from a different. Yeah, from the LA office. From the LA office. But is that, is there a name for, I mean, so that's the national touring division? Would that be? Yeah, it? there's actually, it's, there's two different national touring offices. One in Los Angeles, the other in Toronto. And Toronto has a lot of the, it's called global touring. That's Madonna, U2, Lady Gaga, the police when they toured, um, Rush, as we spoke of earlier, um, probably just because they're Canadian. Um, a lot of the, back when we had the Rolling Stones, any of the, the real high caliber that tours come out of Toronto. Toronto. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and then, so LA, so when an LA based national tour is booked, <coughs> you're coming to New York, do they ask you for your input? Oh, we market it. So it'll be, it, it, they'll buy, we'll buy the whole tour. We'll go to an artist and say, okay, we'll give you X number of dollars per date for your whole summer tour. It happens a lot for the amphitheater tours, so the Def Leppards of the world that really only tour in the summer. Um, most of those are, they come out of the touring entity. Um, but that's not to say that we don't have a lot that go into the arenas. Um, uh, Stevie Wonder is a Live Nation tour. Sometimes we don't have the entire tour. We may have 80% of the tour. But when it's booked, and then they'll talk to the local office, obviously for the venue avails. So they'll reach out and say, OK, we want to do MSG or Barclays Center on these dates. And then locally, the bookers will get involved. But sometimes that's also handled by the LA office. So it depends. But at the end of the day, regardless of where this comes from, Toronto, Los Angeles, they'll come to us and we market it. So once the show is confirmed, it goes to marketing, ticketing, and production. Production goes through and figures out sight lines and size of stage and how many seats and, and if it's going to be 180, 220, where they're going to set it up to start selling the seats. Um, ticketing builds the show and then we market it. So we'll reach out and put together a marketing plan which includes a paid component and a promotional component. And then we send to the respective management or our touring office, get everything approved, it's announced, we go on sale, and we hope for the best. So there's <clears throat> different genres of music that come through the marketplace. So you mentioned Stevie Wonder, for example, and you know um, he appeals to a, a, a broader audience than in a different way than some of the rock acts you mentioned. And um, now you guys obviously have country artists coming through, which I would imagine is a little more challenging, at least in, in the Manhattan area, um, because of the local media has only recently had a local country station. Um, so is radio still maybe the dominant forum for you to try to help get the word out? That's the best question, really. And when I moved, to, I've only been in New York about three and a half years. And when I moved here, no one drives. So when do you listen to the radio, usually, but in your car, satellite or terrestrial? So I asked, I, don't, I still ask people, do you listen to the radio? And I have yet to find somebody in three and a half years, just random. It's not anybody in the industry necessarily, just people who are friends of friends or whatever, and I, unless they own a car and they live in New Jersey or Long Island, no, they don't. They don't listen to the radio. But this really is the only city in the country right. where that applies. So when you're putting together these plans, and we've, we've changed, and, and I do want to get your interaction and your input on this because we've changed the way we market shows, and it continues to change. There'll come a time in the not too distant future where 95% of it will be digital. Right now we're probably at 40% digital. But you can't tell a Lady Gaga that you're not going to buy radio spots on Z100. You can't tell um, rock and roll, any rock artist, whether it's Santana, you know, Foo Fighters, ACDC, that you're not going to be on cue. So there's still that 
perception that in every other city in the country or any other any pl any place, radio is the driving force uh, behind selling concert tickets. As we do research, it's not. I mean, word of mouth is still on one of the top, so that's really interesting. But what is word of mouth? Is word of mouth going on an artist's website? Is word of mouth getting an email blast, an email, seeing it on someone's social page? What word of mouth can take on many forms. Uh, it, it's difficult because, you know, with radio now you're, you you look at Pandora and you look at Spotify and you know Sirius we've even purchased, um, but that's limiting because you can only you know it's it's the news talk stuff, and it's the whole country. So we've worked a lot more to incorporate Pandora and Spotify in the mix, uh, but the artists do, they don't want to get rid of radio yet. Not even close, actually. So what about <clears throat> local t television and cable? The whole dynamic has really changed quite a bit. If you looked at an ad plan, actually, when I started three and a half years ago, I looked at the ad plan, and I thought it was 1985. But it turned out that they just hadn't, they weren't digital. They weren't even really advertising on Facebook, which still turns out to be probably the best return on investment of any. Facebook. It's, Facebook is really changing how you can advertise. Uh, it used to be much more efficient. You didn't even before you didn't even really have to advertise, but now you can't even really post something without boosting it because your audience will be so small. So th the the climate continues to really change. Um, TV, it's you know there's so much vanity. The other big thing with New York, and I'm sure it's the same in LA, is the vanity part of it. People want to see things. They want to know that if they listen between 6 and 10 a.m., everybody's going to hear the radio spot. Everybody's going to watch the Today Show and see the spot. You're going to watch Stevie Wonder last night. You were going to see the Stevie Wonder spot that cost $22,000. $22,000 digitally would last so long in trackable sales and, you know, retargeting. The way retargeting targeting works now is incredible. So if you just put the money into retargeting, so if you go on Ticketmaster and you look up Stevie Wonder, we're going to haunt you. We're going to keep following you until you buy a ticket. If you go, I'm sure everybody's looked at shoes or whatever, and then all of a sudden you see in your Facebook on the side, I just looked at those shirts. I just looked at that chair. So the ability to retarget and really focus the digital is going to outweigh everything, but there's still the the difficulty in the mindset. So we'll spend $500 on a Facebook campaign, and one of the talent buyers will say, well, how many tickets did we sell? Well, we only sold 30. OK, well, we just spent $22,000 on a TV spot, and we have absolutely no idea how many tickets we sold because of that. So it's a big learning curve, and it, it, especially with digital, it, everything continues to change. It gets better, but it gets more difficult. It's fragmented. The market it is so fragmented. For you to achieve the critical mass, you need to sell tickets. You've got to do, I would assume, an abundance of different media. Um, and then you have the vanity play, as you called it, where they're going to expect to see their spot on the local avail on the Today Show or, or, or Fox Morning Show. Uh, <coughs> and, and you know, you question what the value of that is. And then, you know, terrestrial radio, they, they're going to expect and they want to know, well, you're not supporting me. You didn't buy, you didn't buy any advertising there, and you're not sure how effective that is is what you're saying. Yeah, correct. I mean, I do think that if there was one sure way to sell a ticket, we probably would have figured it out by now. So there's not. It's multiple messaging. Uh, you know, last night on that Stevie Wonder special, normally I would say, $22,000, are you insane? But I thought That's it was targeted. a great idea. Yeah. But <clears throat> how different is the New York because of the car? And because you're under the microscope, every artist and every manager, versus when you were up at Saratoga. Well, the mass, I think that it's, the volume here is insane, but the population is insane. So I think that typically, like our database is 1.6 million that we reach every week with a newsletter, and then we'll send out e-cards that are artist specific. So we can reach a lot of people that way. And if there's a pre-sale, sometimes we sell out in pre-sale. So some of these shows, we've, we've had usually not when, they, when it's the size of an arena show, but we also have some smaller venues, 3,000-ish. Sometimes we don't spend a penny. We just put it out on social media, send out um, an email blast, and it's sold out. You usually know which ones those are going to be. 
but not always. And then, you know, with the, I know we briefly talked on the way here about some of the credit card supported programs with the cities and Amex and Chase and the money that they put behind it to get and give us assets so that they get the pre-sales and they get the action. How many of you have a credit card? All right, so everybody's credit card. <coughs> Any of you uh, get uh, a bill stuffer in with your monthly statement or go to the ATM machine and see an advert for an ongoing sale for a concert? Anyone had that experience? Or an email blast if you have a city card, um, Amex. And then how many any of you um, subscribe to the Live Nation um, email service? If you bought a ticket wow. through Live Nation, then you probably get it. You can sign up, but it's typically from, and hopefully it's targeted and you're not getting stuff you don't want, but we're still working on it. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, so you have no real, do you do Atlantic City at all or is that out of Philly? No, that's so out of Philly. So you don't have any interface with the House of Blues? No, but back to your point, within Live Nation, there are two, as far as from a, from a programming marketing standpoint, there's North American Concerts, which is typically 3,000 seats and above, and then there's Clubs and Theaters, which is House of Blues. Here in New York, it's uh, Gramercy and Irving Plaza. Um, and they do, their, their volume is tremendous and they have an entirely different, they have no ad budgets or very small ad budgets. So they rely very heavily on word of mouth, the database, old school <laughs> flyering. Don't they also run a, a, a generic ad in the, in the voice? In yeah, the and it used possibly? to be much bigger. But right. even, you know, to your point with radio, print is really, that has really changed where before an artist, typically on a, a show you'll get a marketing letter and it'll go over, sometimes it gives you information about the fan, breakdown demographically, whatever. Other times it'll, it'll get really detailed and say, you know, consider these TV shows for your buy. Um, and it used to always say, you know, must have at least a half page, four color print ad to break the on sale. Now typically the letters read no print, no print, and they're very anti-print. Um, so the Village Voice it used to be this thick, is this thick, and uh, print has really, really changed. So we used to have a double truck, now I think it's a half page. So that, that's definitely changed. There's still, the artists still like the New York Times, you know, full page, four color ad in the New York Times is $93,000 on a Sunday. Um, a lot of times you'll see like an American Express pre-sale and that's paid by American Express. Ever notice that in the and sometimes I guess the record company would chip in because they'd have a mini of the album cover or say they now don't on chip sale. in as much as they should. <laughs> she said. So New York City. Um, but tonight we're in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So we have the Wellmont. Wellmont. And we Nancy. have uh, down down a little further south we have in Asbury Park the Stone Pony. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there's other venues in the state. So what might be different in approaching uh, are alerting the audience for those particular venues that might be different than something in New York City. Or also, we could go out the other way, Long Island, Long Island and talk then. about, um, it's not called Westbury anymore. It's yeah, well, NYCB Theater at Westbury. Hey, they're paying yeah. for that. They're, yeah. pay they're paying for that. Uh, though, so Westbury, Wellmont, and uh, the Summer Stage, Stone Pony, those are out of the club division. So as it relates to what I do, it's PNC Bank Art Center, Jones Beach, Prudential Center, MetLife Stadium, IZOD, um, out on Long Island, uh, Nassau Coliseum. The, hunt, the Huntington, I guess that would be the in Paramount. The Paramount, that's a, that's a club theater. I mean, it comes into our umbrella because with, with our messaging, um, with our database, that all goes through me. But in general, I don't direct market those venues. But New Jersey. Everybody likes to say that PNC Bank Art Center and Jones Beach are part of New York. And when we look at the zip code reports that show us who buys tickets from where, they're not. Uh, so I would say that I market those shows more like I marketed upstate New York. Right. So maybe we run a little more print. The New York City stations do carry out into those markets. So it's a combination of the New York radio and the local radio, especially when it, as it relates to country. Um, so it's a little more organic, 
in New Jersey and uh, Long Island than, you know, just trying to clobber you over the head in New York. And, and your message gets heard more here because there's less clutter. <clears throat> what about marketing? I don't know if this is under your umbrella, festivals. And they do, like, they'll do an EDM festival? I've done a couple of festivals. We have Farnborough, which, which is at Randall's Island Country Festival for the first time this year right. um, at the end of June. Um, that's turned out to be a bit of a headache. but um, From a point of view of finding the right way of marketing? Well, it's a, become a challenge because there's a lot of festivals. There's a, there's a lot of country festivals right around that same period. There's one in upstate New York. There's a couple in Delaware. One was just announced by a competitor in Delaware with a three-day ticket at $99. Ours is $250. So that becomes really challenging. And their talent, some would say, is better. Um, so that becomes a, that's a big challenge. That's when marketing gets stuck with a bad hand because no one will ever admit. There's a joke in the industry. It's If it, the show does well, it was a good booking. If a show doesn't do well, it's bad marketing. Marketing rarely gets the, um, the sure. credit. Um, but the nice thing about New York is it is resilient and there are so many people. And when I say, I'll say, you know, proper because when we're, we market, rarely do I market just to New York. It's always New Jersey, Long Island for the most part, unless it's really small and it's an underplay and we're not really doing a lot. Um, but New York is pretty resilient. So we had last year when we had Jay-Z Beyonce at MetLife Stadium, we went on, we, they announced it sold out in pre-sale credit card presale, 35,000 tickets for the first show from a Monday announced to a Wednesday. Then they decided to add the second show on the Wednesday to go on sale Friday, Saturday. And everybody thought it was going to blow out, and we went on sale with 14,000 tickets out of 35. And they didn't have a radio spot because it sounded like a public service announcement, an emergency broadcast, so no radio stations would air it. They didn't have a TV spot because they didn't want one. So here we had 20,000 tickets to sell in about a month, a little less than a month, and we really had no advertising tools to do it. So there was a little bit of pressure with that because essentially that one show was going to ruin the whole year for the New York business unit because there was so much money on it. So I got stuck in the rain and was totally soaking wet, and it occurred to me that we should sponsor weather and traffic because it was the summertime. And we didn't need a spot. We could just say, this message brought to you by Jay-Z and Beyonce. And I mean, that's not the, there was other things done too. But that's one of those situations where you're stuck with the, and you can't change the variables. I can't make them make a radio spot. They're not going to do a TV spot. And what are you going to do? And everyone, you know, Michael Rapino, the CEO of the company, it's on his radar because there's a lot of things at play here. They're not going to go out to 15,000 people at a stadium and perform. You know, the last thing you want to do is start getting tickets out there where people think it's a fire sale. So you can't discount. You can't do any. You know, Groupon has changed the dynamic. We can get into that, too, as another outlet to sell tickets. But on this show, a high level, a high caliber show, um, we had to come up with something creative. So those, that's where you're, the job really gets challenging because you have to think of what to do that's not conventional that's not traditional you know we were talking earlier too how there's no checklist like I don't sit down and say okay we're putting ACDC on sale here's what I need to do there's general parameters where you know what you have to do but sometimes you have to quite often you have to take a step back and try to figure out okay how am I going to sell this who do I need to reach how can I come up with something that's compelling to a certain segment of the audience EDM is a big one you know, when an EDM show isn't selling well, that can be really tricky because it's a, usually a late selling show. And, you know, why isn't it selling? Uh, they don't want to sit. They don't, you know, they want to warehouse. There, there are a million reasons. Well, that's too bad because I have this show at Madison Square Garden and I have to sell the tickets to it. So there's a lot of different dynamics and, you know, it's, it's not, okay, well, I did these five things that didn't sell. I'm not sure what you want me to do. You have to figure it out, and that, that's the biggest challenge because when you talk about a lot of, say this industry has a lot of ego, it's never, it's never going to be, I mean, the artist certainly, if everybody thought they could sell that many tickets and it's not, it's usually marketing is, is the scapegoat. Um, <clears throat> what about non-music stuff? 
Um, Live Nation used to do some theater, used to do some motor sports, and they got rid of all of that. So Live Nation is strictly a musical entity at this I'm point. I'm trying to think of anything. We do sometimes there's a, a legendary promoter, Ron Delsner, who's still in the fold at Live Nation. And he typically likes to challenge the marketing department with very esoteric programming. Um, and he'll do a lot of foreign acts. Oh, he'll yeah. do some things that are, you know, nobody like, how do you, how do you say that name? And it's just like, oh, no. Um, but generally, it's all music based. Sometimes we'll, like, if we're adventurous, maybe we'll do someone on Broadway or something. You know, we have Idina Menzel in the amphitheaters, which is a bit of an odd mix, really. Um, as evidenced by the sales, um, so but it's pretty. We stay pretty mainstream. We did Ill, an, an Il Devo run on Broadway. That was a bit of a departure for us. But it's mostly music, and it's usually it's all genres of music. And to your point, country's been um, is a big grower in for us. You know, PNC Bank Art Center is tremendous success with country. Most of the country artists that go to MSG sell out. Um, Barclays now is doing some country where we hadn't before. Um, so the country's country's pretty strong. But genre every genre is treated a little differently with marketing and sales and you know, depending on the level of the artist. Um, <coughs> so I don't know, when I when I see a concert or tickets are available for a show on Groupon, I go, oh, I, I guess uh, ticket sales are a little soft, so they want to move some. Is that, <coughs> is that, when, is that a sign that maybe <coughs> the demand is not as great as one thought? Um, in the beginning, yes. Live Nation went through a bunch of knee-jerk years with, uh, let's have $10 Wednesdays or whatever it was, and every Wednesday there'd be a different show available for $10. And it was a really bad move on our part because we trained people to wait. There was, no, there was no reason to buy tickets when they went on sale. There was no reason to do anything because if you waited sooner or later, there was going to be a two for one or a $10 something. Uh, so thankfully, we got away from that model. When the Groupons of the world came in, uh, we typically waited till the last minute. We would see the shows not selling. We'd throw it up on Groupon, look desperate. Um, there's, there's a lot of promoters who still hate Groupon. But you may notice that you'll see these offers come out right when the show goes on sale. So, which is interesting, but you get it right out of the gate. They, Groupon claims that 70% of their database do not know about the show. That, see, that feels high to me, but at the same time, I have a bit of a Groupon issue. And if I see something like, ooh, that's only $10, so I'm buying it because it's cheap. I'm not buying it because I necessarily want it. So I think that that's a big factor in the people who are bargain hunters. And if they think we've done things where we've put it on Groupon and it's not really that much of a different price, if then we'll say, OK, let's do a radio station, $25 Tuesday, whatever, and it's on Groupon for $25, the Groupon tickets sell much faster. So I think there is a little bit of a philosophy. And people who tend to go to those discount channels, they want a deal. Mm. I don't know. They don't share their data, so there's no way to know whether or not 70% really don't know about the show. Seems high. It does seem high. But, I mean, they could say 90. How the hell would we know? Any of you ever bought a concert ticket through Groupon? Oh. Was it a show that you would have gone to, or did you buy it because it was on Groupon? You would have gone? What was it? Um, huh. <laughs> and, and you? Yeah, we went to the circus. I took my kids to the circus. A little bit different, but because it was on sale, all of a sudden you get four tickets for a family, and, you know, 25 yeah. bucks is end up 100 bucks each. And sometimes it really, it's sort of an adjustment because everybody thinks it's going to sell at one price point and it doesn't. So that's one way um, to give value. I still, you know, I, I don't know if I had to, I would prefer to do other things than Groupon, honestly. I would prefer to, we reprice shows where the, the public doesn't know it. So maybe if you looked and you saw it was $80 and you went back two weeks later and now it's $60. So what do I do if I bought the ticket for $80? Hopefully you don't, well, 
It's hard. We try to do it. It's, it's dynamic pricing or flexible pricing. So, so there are some artists that you will get on a call. At, if the show's going on sale at 10 o'clock, you'll get on the phone with them, and they, have, they would have all the top price seats and the second price seats. And in between, there are these sections that may go either way. So if those f the first section of seats sells out at P1 really quickly, they'll flip that middle section to P1. If they don't, they flip them to price level two. Um, so if you bought price level two right away, there's a chance that people five rows ahead of you will spend the same money, and even though you got there first. Um, that's and to be on one, it's like you're at a stock market. It's it's incredible. Um, when Billy Joel and Elton John tour, that's the way they do it. And, you, and you're on the phone, and they'll be like, section two thirteen, flip it to da da da, and it just goes that way constantly. And these poor ticketing guys are sitting there trying to program in real time to sell the tickets to keep up with the way that the, the tickets are selling. We sort of do that uh, with the amphitheater. So if we see that the tickets are selling, um, we'll change the price of the section. So it's a little different, and it's not necessarily done in re real time. Or if the sections are really not selling, we'll, we'll discount them, and then maybe you get an email blast from us saying tickets starting at $25, when before they were starting at 50 so it's not so blatant, it doesn't look so desperate. Or we'll do a four pack. We try not to do, like a lot, I think a lot of the radio station, like today, you $20 tickets, a little hokey. The Kid Rock just came out with a show today, right. with an announcement today. And it's from rows to back, $20 tickets. And if you buy at the box office, it's $20, no service charge. It's a real $20 ticket. And they're taking the front row and some of the, the higher profile seats and doing packages to try to get them away from the scalpers. So um, that, obviously, it's not a high grossing show, but all the messaging is very positive. What about, I see advertised, the VIP experience? So I'm going to buy my ticket. Now I can get the VIP experience. Now what will I get for that? And what will you want in addition to the ticket price to get that experience? That's not done locally. That's either done through the artist. I think um, Kiss was one of the first bands to do that, where they would. I'm sure. Yeah, because I mean, he, they didn't miss a trick. Nope. They would have those front seats, and the only way that you could meet the band was to pay for this VIP experience. And then everybody kind of got on the bandwagon. You know, you'll always find 20 people at least. So. You may not, most people may not like meatloaf, but you'll find 20 people who will pay 150 bucks to meet meatloaf and get a, a seat. And sometimes they'll throw things in. You'll get a lanyard, that, a laminate that means absolutely nothing. A t-shirt, maybe you get a, some cheese and crackers. It, it, it depends. Um, sometimes there's meet and greets, sometimes there's early entry, but that's usually driven by the artist. And, and Live Nation has an artist nation kind of Sometimes they'll funnel it through, but typically that comes from the artist. And part of that, too, is from the scalpers, because all these upfront seats, the scalpers get in there, and they buy them, and they turn around, and they make all this money. And so in the artist's defense, well, let's make it, let's take these seats, let's dress them up with some fancy accoutrements, and we'll get the money. So I don't know that I find anything terribly disturbing about that. I think I have more of a problem with, you know, you go and buy, try to buy a ticket, and now on Ticketmaster there's the reselling. So you can go on and look, or if you go on StubHub and it's sold out, and now it's $1,000 when it was 60 bucks. So the artist is trying to negate some of that stuff and keep some money themselves. Okay. Um, the uh, Artist Nation, which is a division that I guess Mr. Rapino uh, started and I know it's gone through a couple of changes in, as far as personnel, but I see, I think Madonna was one of the first. Mm -hmm. um, then there's uh, U2, um, Gaga. Shakira. Shakira's a big one, yeah. So uh, it was Nickelback. A Nickelback. Yeah, okay, so then we get a Nickelback tour and we're all stuck with it. And <laughs> stuck. Because it's not, I mean, we have to. Now we've signed this contract and we're in it for 10 years or something like that. And that's but you participate, each of these has a different thing, like you two, um, I think you guys just own them lock, stock, and barrel uh, for another couple of years. Madonna, so, too. Right, so you get the touring money, um, the record company money, 
the piece of the merch. I don't know where the publishing stands, uh, but so it's almost like a 360 deal yeah. um, with, with some of these artists. Yes. Um, and so it's kind of in competition in a certain way with the record labels, although ironically, you're pushing back the artist back on a label because you, you know Live Nation doesn't have the infrastructure to support that, uh, the, the recording and the, the, promo the radio promotion and all that, that's involved with that. So do those artists, you have to, I guess, because the company has so much at stake, you have to really dig down and make sure those things, so as much as Nickelback <coughs> is seamless corporate rock, still you gotta find a way of selling and filling those seats. Yes. Because you guys the are- The deal was made, right. So then you, you'll see a lot of Groupons for Nickelback. You'll see special deals. Uh, and we, everybody knows it. It's gonna be a work project. There was a time Nickelback would sell out which is when the deal was made, but that's not the case anymore. So, yeah, there's some give and take. And we have Rock Nation also, which we should mention, and that's Jay-Z and a lot of, that's a, yeah. that's a big piece of the puzzle. And that doesn't always, just because it's Live Nation and under the Live Nation umbrella, it doesn't always mean that there's that synergy that's happening. You know, even with Ticketmaster, I think everybody gets treated better than Live Nation with Ticketmaster. We joke about that, but I don't know how much it's really a joke. So just because, and, and there's certain scrutiny because they think, oh, it's Live Nation, they're going to um, get an advantage. A couple of, two years ago, we went on sale with Jimmy Buffett, and Jimmy Buffett's agent is difficult. And the morning, we're getting on this said call, because he's also Elton John's agent, and we find out about two hours before that the Yankees are going on sale at the same exact time. It's only funny now. It was not funny then. So we're all like, oh, no. And we have to get on the phone with the agent. And they say, okay, how many tickets are in open? How many tickets are in question mark? Question mark means it's in the middle of a transaction. And then you can find out how many tickets are on queue. So they're not even in a question mark yet because they can't get on. And someone casually mentions, well, the New York Yankees tickets, single game tickets are going on sale today. And then the agent asks the question five minutes in, okay, how many are in question mark? And there's hardly any in question mark because there's like 14,000 in queue. Wow. And that was not a good day. That went all the way up to the CEO. And, but Ticketmaster never told us. So we wouldn't know when a sporting event was going on sale. So that was a little tricky, but those, you know, there's Ticketmaster and Live Nation, and here we found out because one of the guys in the office got an email from the Yankees. Hmm. And <clears throat> have there been any cases where Live Nation's partnered with a another promoter? Yeah, we do that sometimes. Um, if if there's New York is interesting because there's a lot of competition. So in most markets, you know, AEG is Live Nation's biggest competitor. It's less than half the size of, of Live Nation. Here in New York, Bowery is a big competitor um, on more of the indie interesting bands. Uh, so you may get somebody who has a relationship with an artist. Um, John Cher, we talked about earlier, he has a relationship with Jason Mraz, and we had the Jason Mraz um, Five Borough Tour that we had to partner with him on. So sometimes the nice thing, there's still a little loyalty in the industry. And if there's, a, if there's history with an artist with a certain promoter, sometimes they stay true to it. And it doesn't matter about money, sometimes. Sometimes. So I go back to the quote Doug Morris, who's now the CEO of Sony, said, you want loyalty? Get a dog. Commentary on the business. Um, so a couple of questions here um, from some of the students. Um, Jillian posted a couple of really interesting questions. And um, she said, uh, if you could give any advice to a college student planning to pursue a career in the music industry someday, what would that be? I think um, what I see, it goes back to the passion. What I see, the biggest change, we get interns, I have a staff of six, most of them are younger, um, and the biggest difference I see, I've seen over the last 20 years is the level of commitment. Um, you know, when I started, if they had given me a toothbrush and told me to go clean the stage, I would have done it twice. Um, I didn't care, it was whatever it took, but I truly loved it. I loved being around every part of it, uh, and now, 
you know, there's a certain element of a lot of this, a lot of these younger people that come through that they want to be rewarded for showing up. That doesn't, it might, it may, you may be okay, but it's certainly not going to help you rise to the top. So, you know, it's, it's the biggest thing I can say is even when we get interns, if we ask a question and we get the answer, that's great. Yeah, sure, that's what we've asked you to do. But when they come back and say, okay, well, I noticed that I saw these three events that are very similar, and how about, and they have a relationship with so-and-so. It's thinking outside the box, taking it one step further. Uh, that's the biggest difference, and I think that's what you follow through being, you don't have to be terribly creative. You just have to think about it for 10 minutes. So if it, you can find something online and sound like you're an expert and spend 15 minutes doing it just because you took the time to look into it a little bit. Um, I don't know how many times there will be artists that we have that maybe we don't know and someone who just looks it up and says, oh, they could sound like an expert. No one else really knows too much more, so it doesn't take much. Do the homework. Spend a little time. But I think that really comes from if you're passionate about what you're doing. If you really want to do it and you really, you may not know anything about it, but that's how you learn and that's where I, I think the, the passion grows. I didn't know anything about the ballet and I'm going to the ballet Thursday night and it's 25 years later. So, you know, I hadn't been to a ballet and I was 21 years old and I had no idea what, what the hell was going on. I learned and I became a fan. But that did help me with my career because the more you know, the more it shows. So really taking the time, investing it. You're investing in yourself. That's it. That'll set you apart tenfold because I don't see a lot of it anymore. And going uh, hand in hand with that question was what was the uh, best advice you received throughout your career? Um, you know what? It's, it goes, I would probably say when I was at Syracuse, I had to do a paper on um, somebody influential in the community. And I did it, the head of SPAC. And we went through this whole Q&A, and we talked about everything. And then I said to him, you know, basically, what is, what is it that keeps you doing this after 25 years? And he said, it has to be fun. If the minute it's not fun, I don't want to do it anymore. Um, so I don't know if that was the best advice as far as just that statement goes, but I think it goes back into the, the passion and, and finding excitement. I mean, there's nothing better than standing, like Jay-Z and Beyonce, standing in that second show knowing that, you know, it was a rough month and having it sold out. The feeling that you get, like, that you had something to do with it. And it's, it's not just, okay, well, they made millions of dollars. We made a lot of money. People, when, when I say what I do, one of the most gratifying things is people who come up to me and say, I saw so-and-so, and this is, and I proposed to my wife, and, you know, I had this happen, and, and people light up, and it's such an amazing thing to know that somehow, even so slightly, I had something to do with creating such a memory for this person, and that... You know, they'll remember that people you work in a bank for like, oh, you know, I made a deposit last Tuesday and it was, who cares? You know, it's a harder job to get, but I think that it's very gratifying. Um, and I don't know that as far as one, one single piece of advice, I, I wish I had something really funny to say, and I, I don't. Um, but it was, it's just, you know, there's a lot of, be true to yourself. I was, I've never really compromised any of um, my integrity in this job, and I think that it's probably easy to do that. Now, I'm not saying I haven't stretched the truth on occasion, but in general, just like doing a good job is doing a good job. And if you're really trying to do your best, um, it's easy to just get by. But I think just going that extra mile is, is and I don't know that anyone told me that. I'm not, maybe my father did. I'm not sure. But I loved everything. I was so into where I was and so glad to be part of it that it never felt like a job. And it, well, it sometimes feels like a job now. But in general, especially at your age and you, your place, everything is still magical. 
And I get jaded. Someone the other day was like, yeah, Paul McCartney's playing Irving Plaza, but I'm going to go upstate. And everyone's like, are you out of your mind? You can go see that? And it's not certainly not out of choice. But sometimes I think when you're new and you're seeing things for the first time, it is amazing. And I get probably a little mad at myself when I'm just like, this is, I saw Foo Fighters at Irving Plaza. I mean, people would kill for that experience. Or, and just taking a step back and realizing, this is amazing. It's an amazing, I have the best stories um, really ever. I have no trouble talking to people about my job. And, you know, but it does come from a place of passion. It does kind of, and it's hard work. I mean, I can, I don't know how many times I've missed vacations, friends going on a boat, friends going to the beach, friends going wherever, and I had to stay because I had to go to a show. Sometimes it wasn't the best show either. And, you know, you have to go, and you sit there, and you're like, I can't believe I'm missing all of this, or my friends are in Florida, and I'm sitting here, you know, at Harry Connick Jr., or whoever, and I, not to say that he's not worth seeing. But, you know, you get stuck, you're like, who the hell is this anyway? One time I had a conversation with Sarah Brightman for 20 minutes. I had no idea who she was. Then it was funny. Thankfully, I didn't say anything stupid, but... You know, and I was young, but it was just like I didn't know what to expect from Sarah Brightman, and the show was really quirky and fun. But there's a lot of sacrifice for this. Yeah, just talk to her about going uh, in, in, into space. This was way before that. Okay. I was young, and she—I had no idea who she was. But there's, you know, it's—it's a—it is a labor of love. It's a lot of fun. Um, it's not a nine-to-five job. It's not a, you know, here's the five things you should follow and you'll be fine. It's not. It's not but, any of those things. But you, ref you referenced some sacrifices. Lots of sacrifices. If you look at, you know, if you look at my office, there's, their hours are crazy. And there's a lot of single people. And there's not, it's very difficult to um, maintain a healthy balance. Balance. Because, but then part of, you know, like my social life is going to shows or being with work people. So it's a hard, it's a hard, it's not a hard balance. It's an amazing balance because it's a built-in social life, but at the same time, you, your, your hours are committed and you're spending a lot of time outside of the home. So if, hypothetically, you left Live Nation and took a job working for an independent promoter or crossed the street and went to work for AEG, how many of those people you socialize or, or work with going to concerts and stuff would still maintain a relationship I don't with know. You. you know what? Probably not a lot. I can't imagine, um, because you get so stuck and set in what you do, and there's not a lot of time. I was, always think there's a difference between friends and business acquaintances. Mm -hmm. There absolutely and, is. And, and then sometimes you sit back and you look, you know, whatever, and, and you think, I just spent 20 years doing things with people that I don't even think I'll talk to, you know, two days after I leave. Right. But then you stop and think, like, well, why are you really doing it? Is it, it's not, it's not necessary. Like, I would go to a show, but in high school, I would go to concerts by myself. And all of my friends thought I was weird. I'm like, well, what do you, you don't sit and talk. You watch the show. I guess that probably is why I'm sitting here right now. But they all thought, or I'd buy a single ticket. They'd all get their tickets, and I could get a ticket closer if I bought one by myself. So I'd just go sit by myself. <laughs> A little odd, perhaps, but I don't think I ever went totally alone. I think I would just branch off when I got there. But now I watch concerts by myself all the time. Do you go to the movies by yourself? I've done that a couple of times. Okay, so let's ask uh, another question here. This is from Alan, who said, as a major at Syracuse, uh, did you take classes in marketing, or did you develop your interest from real-world experiences and a love of all genres of music, and was it your dream to meet and work with some of your favorite artists? I did not take any management courses at Syracuse. It was hard. They were very hard to get into. Uh, so there was no marketing. And marketing, uh, Newhouse was a very PR, very journalistic, very communications based. It was a communication school. The marketing, there wasn't overlap. So no, I took, I think, an economics class once or whatever. But it was, it basically, the marketing came out of the PR aspect. Um, and yeah, it was the, the desire to, I mean, even when I thought I wanted to be a journalist, I wanted to be a music journalist. So it was the desire for the music to do that. And anything I learned marketing-wise, um, 
I learned, and I didn't really have, when I started at SPAC and we used to do uh, the ad plans, I had to teach myself how to do that. I had no, I had no idea. And I remember the first year, it was an intern from Syracuse, and she looked at me and she's like, how do you think we do this? And I'm like, I don't know, let's get some of the old ones out and take a look and we'll figure it out. And then from that, you know, learn to negotiate. And so it was very self-taught on some on of the, the same. On the job training. On the job, which is big in this industry because there aren't a lot of jobs. There aren't a lot of, you know, you're thrown right into the, you know, from the frying pan right into the fire. But of course, now there's opportunities for students to learn with the abundance of schools that are teaching music industry management. Back then, there weren't, yeah, I don't think there were really any. I mentioned no. to you that there were, at Syracuse, it wasn't a major. I think there was just a couple of classes to take a in DPA. music industry. Yeah, and what, what years are you talking about? I graduated in 89. And I can't remember. I'm trying yeah, to. The program it was in VPA at the time. And now it's branched. It's between Newhouse and VPA with Marty Bandier. Right. right. OK. Matthew says. In your opinion, is LinkedIn an effective means for an artist to market himself or herself? It wouldn't be the first thing I would think of. Um, but, you know, I'd, I'd love to... How many of you listen primarily uh, to music via Spotify? What about Pandora? Oh, what about radio? How, how do you find out about concerts? Is it usually through one of the things I just mentioned or digital? Digital? Digital um, through an email blast or websites? Email blast? No? Twitter, Instagram, so, so more social media based? From artists or from promoters or from all of the above? Artists? Following artists and... So that's interesting. So as a marketer, that's not good news. <laughs> but it, it is reality. Good. Yeah, it is reality, and it is shifting. Um, so I think you know, one of the great things about now with being a musician and trying to get your music out there, there's so many more ways to do it. Uh, where back in the day, it was, you, know, you had to get a label. Now it doesn't even really matter. So LinkedIn's used for a lot. I'm not, we've never used it for anything to promote a concert. Um, I've never, I, I think I'm on it, but I don't really think I, I can't remember the last time I looked at it. So I'm not sure how effective that would be. I've not. And again, I'm not dealing with artists, up and coming artists, typically. I'm either on their way up or sometimes on their way down. But. Um, They're seeking your expertise. Yeah. Um, so we kind of dealt with this, but um, Carolyn says, uh, not a secret, but women are oppressed in the music industry. Do you feel that, had you been a male, would you have obtained your position of VP faster? Have there been any specific moments when you thought of, to yourself, hmm, this wouldn't be like this if I were yes, a man? Yes, absolutely. I don't know that I think I would have gotten it faster. Uh, the, my predecessor was in the position for about 15 years, and it, he was obviously a guy. Um, but when they were interviewing, I, was, I didn't seek them out. They sought me out. So I would think that if, it really, if they were looking for a man to be in that position, uh, they wouldn't have called me. And there was a lot of other women who were sort of in the pool. Where I see the difference is, you know, there's a boys club. There's definitely a boys club in management. I don't know why. Um, I don't know if it, and, and part of me sometimes thinks that it has less to do with my gender and more to do with marketing. Because a lot of marketers are females. So I don't know. If you look at, like, the upper management, they have, they'll have meetings. I'm only in some of them. But when they have these the forecast calls marketing's not on those forecast calls either operations production booking and then booking speaks for marketing that's odd to me so that's not a gender based oddity it's 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 the marketing that makes it that way so i don't know i do think that 
you know, I joke with the guys because in my office and they'll see each other and they give each other, you know, the whole guy smack hug thing. And I look at them and I'm like, okay. And I'm like, yeah, no, I'm good. But joking, and then one of them shakes my hand, but it's, the, it's not that same camaraderie for whatever reason. Um, yet I have, on my team of six, it's half boys, half girls, and I don't feel anything, and I don't think they would either, uh, that there's any kind of gender issue. So I don't know that it, pro, it, I don't know that it took me longer to get here, but I do think here, in my current position, um, when I came to New York, I was a director, and within a year I was promoted to VP. So clearly that, that I don't think my gender was an issue at all. Um, maybe as it relates to how I'm perceived within the New York structure, there's two different ways of, there's two different levels that we operate. One is selling the concerts that we have, hitting our budget w with what we have, and, and working in that way. The other part of the management team focuses on new business, new venues. That's the part I'm not included in. And I think that that, that appears to be odd to me, and perhaps if I was a man, I would be included in that. So they trust my ability to sell the tickets and the shows we have, um, but I'm not, you know, the, the brainstorming and, you know, venues and, and research and all that stuff, not so much. But one would think, logically, you would have access to information would kind of know that stuff. Correct, yes. Hmm. So th that is a little odd. It's, I think it's a it's a balance, and would some women have less issue in one in one regard than I don't know, um, but I don't know that I've ever really felt that I was held back to get a position because I was a woman. Perhaps maybe the dynamic of the position would be different if I was a man. Okay, it's fair. Um, Joelle wanted to know that uh, <coughs> that uh, you have your degree. Well, that's not true. But um, has your degree helped you in your most recent position at Live Nation? There's a lot of Syracuse grads in here, so I have to be careful. No, there aren't. To, to, well, the, you too, which is, you know what, I, I think that, um, that Syracuse carries a lot of, my, having the degree carried a lot of clout. Um, I got my first the internship at SPAC because they knew that Syracuse students were hard workers. So that helped me had I gone to a different school, I don't know, and I did call every week for nine weeks, which probably helped me too, um, that they told me I had to do when I was at Syracuse. So, uh, and by default, someone decided at the last minute not to take the job because I had called nine weeks in a row, they gave it to me. And I was a writer and had never submitted a writing sample, which I thought was very interesting too. And I thought, this is much easier than I thought it was gonna be, not knowing really what happened. Um, so I think that what I learned in Syracuse, Syracuse, college gives you a very good foundation. And what Syracuse really taught me to be an analytical thinker, it taught me um, to work well under pressure, it really taught me how the, to master the English language, which I think is a lost art. Um, did it help me with this current job? No. I don't, if you asked my boss, he wouldn't even be able to tell you what school I went to. But again, I've been in the business for 25 years, so I think that it's great to help you in the beginning. I don't know how much it matters. Maybe I meet a fellow alum, and because we have that commonality, it could lead to some job or something like that. But I don't know beyond that. Um, but I do believe it gave me a strong foundation. You think there are people in your office who don't have college degrees? There are, absolutely. There are some that I would question if they had high school degrees. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of these, because this industry isn't necessarily a college-based industry. If you think about like, a lot of these, there's one guy in the office, and I do think he has his high school degree, but he was promoting concerts on Long Island when he was like 16, 17 years old. So that's how he knew the he knew the bands, he knew the up he he literally knew them. They were sleeping in his basement sometimes because he was promoting shows in these little small rooms. Um, so I think that there's a lot of that part of the talent base that the talent buyers who know because they did it. You know, they lived it. They were out in the vans, you know, back in the eighties, going around with different 
acts trying to get them in. To, they worked in college, perhaps, and they're booking shows. But even more than that, they were in those clubs. And so I don't know how much for a talent buyer. I think any other um, discipline, yes. Like when I hire, I only hire college grads. And when that talent buyer's, you know, ages out. I don't know. I don't know what they do. Well, that's what I'm saying is not having a college degree while you can survive for a certain point. When, when that person becomes, you know, aged out of a business that is very youth oriented, without a college degree, they're going to have a rough time in the marketplace because people like you and most people are asking for a college degree or some sort of something so educational to show you have some sort of ambition or I don't know what the right word is. You've completed something satisfactorily. Maybe it's the completion of something, but I think that, you know, even if um, at this stage of the game, if somebody came who had 20 years experience in something, I mean, talent buying is hard because what does that translate to? If I didn't market concerts anymore, ideally I could go market something else. Right. Ideally. Right. Uh, but it is a very different way of marketing. So it, traditionally, if you go work for or um, Palm Olive or something, they don't market like we market. No. Like, we don't, they don't buy cost per point, or we don't buy cost per point usually. Oh, I did do U U.S. Cirque du Soleil I worked on, so non-music. I can't believe I forgot that. I had to, yeah. So I have worked, we have worked on non-music, but we bought cost per point. That's why I, that makes yeah. me think of it. Um, but, you know, if, if you're buying, I don't know that I could go and be a real media buyer. I probably could figure it out. But, you know, buying on cost per point and really looking at all of those numbers, does the station play the artist? Okay, we'll buy the station. So it's a very different level of marketing, and it's not, and it's not highly sophisticated by any stretch. We can get creative in how we're negotiating deals, and we do with TV stations and radio stations and even our digital partners to create these packages, but it's certainly not anything I've ever found in a book. So... I think it's tricky because I'd be limited, even though I'm a marketer, you know, I don't know that I couldn't, I couldn't go work for some fancy place. I, and, and a booker, I don't know what they do. I never knew it. I, even a booker with a college degree, I don't know what they would do. Because say they have a degree in psychology and they're 55 and they've been booking concerts for 30 years, what the hell are they going to do? Go work in a, they probably would be qualified to work in a mental ward, actually. <laughs> But you know what I'm saying. I think that, you know, it, it's, it's a little more difficult. A lot of the people in sponsorship at Live Nation, that translates. You're selling sponsorship. Um, ticketing, if you're, what does that translate to? So I think what you're saying <coughs> is it speaks to getting a broad interdisciplinary major in college so that you have a skill set so that you're not a one-trick pony because once that, as the business is, I mean, it's, it's a very fluid business. Things are always changing. And at some point, either you age out or someone comes to the realization that they don't want to do this anymore or, they're, or they're, someone takes away their ball, bat, and glove. So what else do they do? That's a hard one. And I, you know, I, we joke sometimes and it's just like, I don't, you know, what would I do? What would I, because part of the problem is you're in this business, you love it. Sometimes things change, you know, with the consolidation over the last 20 years right. of, of concert promoters, <clears throat> the, the, the jobs are few and far between. So it's hard to go from something like this to something like a nine to five job, whatever that might be. Could I get a job marketing somewhere? Yes, I, I somewhat joke. Sure, I could. Would I be bored? Would it be less satisfying? You know, maybe there'll probably come a time where it won't be. You know, hopefully that's not my that's my choice and not somebody else's. Um, but I do think that you know entertainment is is very unpredictable in a lot of ways, and education is important so that you do have other options. Um, because as as much as I joke, I can't I do I can buy on cost per point, and I could figure it out. It's not how I do it now, but certainly I know how to deal with all kinds of media. I know how to negotiate. I know how I've got all the tools. I would just have to kind of change how I use them. It's interesting when <coughs> SFX first rolled up all the concert promoters mm -hmm. and bought them out, and they had the opportunity to either stay with the company or do something else. You know, these guys had for 25, 30 years have done nothing but book talent, 
and run their concerts and run it the way that they knew how. And here they are with a new boss and a new, you know, marching orders. So you see, you know, like uh, the promoter in Philly, Larry Maggot, um, very actively got involved in promoting Broadway shows. Um, so he's very much involved with things like that. So he kind of said, okay, if I can't do this, I'm going to do that. Um, and there were other guys um, who couldn't make the transition and kind of stayed there and became employees. And I wonder, I mean, you and I were joking on the way over, the guy who for years controlled the New York marketplace was a, a fellow named Ron Delsner. Um, and, you know, um, Live Nation has been very gracious in allowing him to keep his, his hat in the ring and, and bring in his special relationships with certain artists that no other people can. But one, you know, it's, it's, it's not a joke, it is funny, but it's not, is what would he wind up doing today if Live Nation had said, sayonara, go do something else? I mean, he'd probably still probably be crazy enough to try to promote some shows. Oh, and he still does on his own. It's called Honest Concerts, which is really ironic. But he will still do that. But to your point, you know, here was a man who he ran the company. He ran New York. He was, he was the man. a legendary concert promoter. One right. of the, Bill Graham and Ron Delsner really started for the yeah. all practical purposes of the, you know, the majors. Um, and he still... He's an old school. He will keep the New York Times in business with his print ads. He still loves a print ad. But last year he went out and booked um, Jackson Brown and John Fogarty. He doesn't rely he on touring. Neil Young at Carnegie Hall too. I think. He does Neil. He's got some kind. He's got some relationships. But he put together his own package that was one of the biggest selling tours of. The, it was only at Jones Beach and PNC where everybody else sort of relies on touring to pass it down. He doesn't. He goes out and chases it. You know he got. Uh, Roger Waters a couple of years ago because they're close friends. He's Billy Joel's daughter's godfather something. I mean, the, so the relationships back then, I mean, they were long-standing relationships. And there are some artists who will only work with Ron. There are other artists who won't get, pick up the phone. But that goes with anything. So I don't know what he would do. Maybe used cars? I'm not sure. He would sell a lot of used cars if he did. I know... Um there was a promoter who did a lot of eclectic singer-songwriter, jazz, folky shows on new audiences. And the fellow's name is Julie Loken. And I think he's been very inactive in recent times. And, but I know now he um, is an EMS guy. So, I mean, he said, I can't make money doing this anymore. What am I going to do with the rest of my life? And so he became an EMS thing. So I guess what I'm saying to, to all of you guys in the footnote to all this is, you know, it's wonderful to be involved in this glitzy showbiz world. It's the joke about the guy shoveling elephant manure and being asked, um, so I can double your salary um, if you do this other job. And what? Give up showbiz? Um, and so, you know, um, I, I say to you in all reality, while you're young now and you go, wow, well, that would never happen. You know, years fly past quickly and you could wake up one morning and because it's such a fluid transitory business, you could find yourself you know, with a skill set that might not have any value in, the, in that current environment. And so while you're in school, I, you know, really encourage you to look at other opportunities that are, you know, very much related so that if things don't work out um, for you the way you want them to, that you have something else to fall back on. Um, so that, that's just, you know, take, take that piece of wisdom from somebody old or, or not. Um, this is a question from Tyler. Um, Tyler works at the Wellmont Theater in Montclair and says, I always see Live Nation printed on every ticket. If someone wants to play the Wellmont, do they have to go through Live Nation? That building, yes. It's a, we don't own and operate all of the buildings we do shows at. The Wellmont, we do. I was, gonna, I was a little while ago since I asked you to explain the relationship Live Nation with venues in general. So some of them um, are owned and operated. They, for the most part, it's the amphitheaters, and that's where we make the majority of money. That's exclusive. So exclusive. We are Jones Beach and PNC, the Wellmont, the Summer Stage. Um, I'm trying to think what else. But you don't, you don't own the actual facility. You have an exclusive license right. to be the so, th so the PNC is I think owned by the state yes, of New Jersey. Yes, but we have a long term lease. Same thing with Jones Beach. Some of the amphitheaters in the country, they literally Live Nation owns them. Others, um, they're 
state or I think the highway authority owns PNC, the state owns Jones Beach, the state owns Saratoga Performing Arts Center, but we have exclusive booking rights, but beyond that, we, we act as the operator. So we're not going in, like in Madison Square Garden, we'll book a show there, they have their own infrastructure, they have their own concessions, management, ticketing, uh, house staff, production, and we're just basically renting the facility. At a Jones Beach, Wellmont, PNC, uh, we, we have everybody there. So it's our contract with concessions. It's our contract with the merchandise. It's our people parking you in the lot. It's our people selling you tickets. So we then get that revenue stream. Um, when we're doing a third party venue, which is everything else where they have their own structure and we're just saying, hey, we have um, the Foo Fighters and we want to play MetLife. So we pay them rent. Within the rent, certain things are included, uh, but the, where it's the most profitable is where we have access to every revenue stream. So that's not to say we can't make money on other venues, but some of the venues, if you look like a show at the Beacon Theater that we promote, we may walk out of there making $5,000. So it can be a lot of work for relatively little return. We can also lose a lot of money. We, we, we're fairly good at that as well. So, and sometimes in a summer series, so if we at a PNC Bank Art Center, if we have Cadillac concert series and then we have season seats, so we'll go out and sell the box seats and then season seats when they get VIP club and parking, we may take a show that we know is going to lose money, but we'll take it because it helps us fulfill sponsorship obligations and season seats. So if we promise you spend $10,000 on this season seat and we'll give you 26 shows, if we're at 25 shows and we have this stinky show, but we're going to book it because we need to hit that 26th show, we'll do it. Or, you know, we've promised to sponsor X number of shows and we haven't delivered. So there's a whole, there's a different dynamic. At a Madison Square Garden or a Barclays, we don't have those sponsors. We don't have any of those other revenue streams. So it's not as important for us to make sure that it's a full season. And that's not the way that those are designed anyway. So, you know, when we're getting ticket, the, the artist takes the majority of the ticket money. Um, where Live Nation makes the money for the most part is the concession, is the Ticketmaster rebates, um, parking, not really merch as much, but, and when we can sell season seats, where we can sell sponsorship. So that helps it, that helps us make our money. When Madison Square Garden, as you can imagine, most, famous arena in the world, not a lot of upside there for a concert promoter, but it's very prestigious and the artists want to play there. And speaking of which, a question here from Justin, <clears throat> if a band is scheduled to play a venue, how much does it cost to reschedule that concert? Does it depend on the price to rent out the venue? So if a concert cancels? Then it's got to be rescheduled. Um, it depends. If it's the day of the show, then we have to pay whatever. If they load it in, so if a show loads in usually in the morning, six, seven, eight o'clock in the morning, if we've paid stage hands and all of that, then we've incurred those costs. Depending on the situation, it could be a cost that's shared with the artist. If by chance the show just, we know a month in advance that it's gonna be rescheduled, typically we'll have to eat the advertising costs because we have to relaunch the event. Um, but that's usually it. There's different situations, but as long as the show's not loaded in, we're usually in good shape. Sean asks, what has been your greatest challenge at Live Nation? Um, I would say Jay-Z and Beyonce, but that was much easier than it sounded. Um, in general, I'm not even going to say, uh, actually, that it's not shows, because typically you can figure out one way or the other and sometimes it's just you know there's a bunch of jokes you can only put you can only what is it shine a turd so much you can only put so much lipstick on a pig all those things so some shows you know okay you know what you're throwing good money after bad or whatever that is so you it's just not going to sell i think the biggest challenge that i found in new york um i had gone from managing a staff of one to a managing a staff of five or six and it wasn't so much finding someone who knew how to do the job well or finding people who knew how to do the job well. It was finding a dynamic that worked and figuring out each person's 
strengths and each person's weaknesses and then trying to build on those. So if I have two event marketers and I know one's better at digital than the other and the other one's good at PR, it took me a little time to kind of figure out the dynamic and how to get them, all of them, to work together um, for the greatest results. So that was a big challenge because it took me two and a half years and quite a few personnel changes. You know, certainly not all my choice because some people got there and realized they didn't want the time commitment. They didn't want, they didn't like the lack of structure even though it's sort of structured. So finding people to fit and then finding a good group to work together uh, was much more difficult than I thought it would be. But now I have a great team. A number of people ask a similar question, but they want to know, working at Saratoga Performing Arts Center, how did that prepare you for where you are? I think you answered this, and then what, are the, what were the significant differences that you encountered from working with one venue as opposed to multiple venues? And I think you kind of covered these, but a number of people asked that question. That's actually a good question, because it was very different. It was a different time, too. The 90s were definitely different um, than the last decade, for sure. Music industry was different. It was a little more laid back. Now it's become much more business oriented. Um, I can remember in the 90s you sitting on a road case next to an artist watching the main act and it was no big deal and now it's much more rigid. I think that what I learned at SPAC was um, the necessity to learn and the necessity to really keep up on whatever it was. Now, I was trying to learn something that I had no idea about. I didn't know, as I mentioned, much about classical arts at all. And then I had to learn about not only the art form, but also the audience. Because um, I really didn't know what the, I wasn't that audience. So understanding you know, all the pieces of the puzzle. So whether, you know, I, I end up on my team, I, end, I market all the EDM shows. Like I'm older than probably some of these kids' parents, and I'm marketing to these kids. So it's really understanding um, the pieces of the puzzle. I do most of the country shows. I don't even like country music, but I understand it. I used to do, um, I remember the Allman Brothers manager told a boss years ago, we like working with Donna. She really understands the music. I don't even like the Allman Brothers. So, but I didn't have to. I needed to understand it. And I didn't, whether I liked the ba ballet or not was irrelevant. I just needed to understand it. So that taught me that you don't, like, it, it, there's no way in any, certainly not this industry, when you're doing so many different forms and genres of music, you can't like them all. And you don't have to, but you have to understand them. And I learned that at SPAC because I had to learn about things that I had no clue about. And it really taught me to dig in and just understand it, try to figure out, OK, what is it about this that makes people like it, whatever that means. Uh, David asked this question, does the popularity of a band really correlate with the size of the venue? And in, those, in which circumstance is that not the case? Usually, yes. But there's a lot of circumstances where it's not the case. Um, sometimes a band wants to do an underplay, like Paul McCartney at Irving Plaza or the Foo Fighters at Irving Plaza. Um, but probably more often than not, we had Imagine Dragons probably three years ago at Jones Beach. And sometimes we'll do scaled down shows in bigger venues. We do it at Barclays. We do it at Jones Beach, PNC, where we only think we're going to sell, maybe it's a PNC only under in the pavilion. So we think we're going to sell four to 6,000, um, not expecting to sell the lawn. Same thing at Jones Beach. We can sort of section it off so we're only selling a portion of the seats. And Imagine Dragons, we thought was going to sell maybe 6,000, and it sold out at 14,000. So from the time it was booked till the time it played, there was a big swing. So sometimes we don't know. Thankfully, we had the luxury of moving it. Usually, it's moving it in the other direction, where it doesn't sell enough tickets, and maybe it goes from, you know, a Radio City uh, to a, or a, a, a Hammerstein to an Irving. But typically, um, the younger, the newer acts are harder to predict. We had Hosier early on, uh, and now he'll, you know the, he'll probably start going to arenas where we had. We have a Beacon show coming up, a Hammerstein show. But he started at Irving Plaza. So 
It's harder with the new bands, but it certainly can happen at any stage. Um, if any of you have any questions, feel free to um, raise your hand. I mean, I, I have more questions here, but if any of you guys have questions that have come up in the conversation, please don't hesitate. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we're here tonight. Yes, sir. Before Real Heavy sponsorship, oops. Before Real Heavy sponsorship, there used to be sort of a unwritten rule that it, about 70% of the show sold would be a break-even point. Not that everybody would be happy, but it would be a break-even point. Is that still sort of a a yardstick or something you go by? It no, you know the part of. And live, what Live Nation did with its sponsorship division, it's totally separate from the concert division. So any sponsorship that's sold doesn't hit our bottom line. So we can't rely on sponsorship dollars at all, which makes it, that's not the way it always was, but it makes it much more difficult. There are some shows where break even, you know, on an arena it could be 13,000 tickets. Um, there are some shows because of the touring dynamic that we have to take that we don't want. So if they promise an act 15 shows and we only have 13 to round it out, two, two markets get stuck with a show that they may go in knowing they're going to lose $200,000, but it's part of a bigger deal. At the end of the day, the sponsorship division, obviously, for Live Nation as a big picture, Wall Street, it works, but on a local level, it can get difficult, and there is no, there's no rhyme or reason to that anymore. It, it's not factored in. So much. There are other building deals, sort of, if we have any um, interaction. If the building's selling the sponsorship, it may change. That doesn't happen that often, though. Um, <clears throat> the question was asked by uh, Matt. In uh, what ways does Live Nation change its marketing to draw in crowds of a lower age that is an under 21 <clears throat> compared to shows that are geared towards adults? Um, I would probably say, you know, I mentioned earlier that a lot of our focus is changing to digital. It's about, I would say, we, on average, it's maybe 40%. If you take, there are some EDM shows where it's 95% digital. Uh, and digital covers social, too. So anything, you know, we wouldn't, we usually don't promote EDM on radio, never on TV. Um, so it, that, that's the biggest difference and if we're trying to market um, you know maybe John Fogarty or Bob Seeger uh, we'll have less digital but still a lot of the Google search stuff <laughs> and the retargeting we'll still do it's just gonna be a much smaller so maybe it's 20 percent of the budget as opposed to you know 80 on a younger show and on a lot of those shows the, depending on who the artist is sometimes we don't spend any money I referenced earlier um, if it's a hot act and it's it's an email blast and it's some social posts with maybe a little bit money, a little money put behind Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or whatever, um, but a lot of the young younger skewing tends to sell quicker if it's a hot act. The clubs and theaters, I think their budgets for Irving and Gramercy are like five hundred dollars a show, so they rely almost exclusively on social media and messaging within the shows with whether it's but there's standard things they already have built in like the ad and the voice and that's about like that. it but that's above and beyond the 500 right no actually that's that comes out of the 500 yeah wow all right um jessica wanted to know if you were ever starstruck when I mean, you got a chance to meet an artist that you really admired someone just asked me this the other day and it was so funny because they think i'm jaded and um okay. ironically when Yes, I haven't, I don't think in a, I'm usually more starstruck if I see somebody I don't expect to see. So if I see the artist, I'm expecting to see the artist, it doesn't phase me. But way back when I first started, um, after college, the position was just seasonal. So I was looking for a job, and back then before there were rules, I was a security guard at the dressing room for Cher. And I was a little starstruck there. And. Um, David Bowie, one of my eyes is two different colors, and he noticed it. So what better conversation was, I was 23 years old and I could barely talk. And then um, the funniest one, uh, we had, it was an orchestra performance, and Buzz Aldrin was reading 
during a presentation of the planets, and he was doing a press conference, and the first part of the orchestra performance was Star Wars. So he was walking down the hallway with Buzz Aldrin to Star Wars music, and I couldn't stop laughing. But he was, I mean, what he walked on the moon. So it was, that was really funny, and I was a little like, he had a very big presence. It was just, you knew you were in the midst of somebody who was definitely um, a little different. So I can't say. It's an eclectic mixture. It uh, is. Buzz Aldrin, David Bowie, and Cher. Cher. Not bad, huh? I don't really think um, in the last, the, the thing is back in the 90s you saw a lot more of the artists. Now um, you don't necessarily see them as much at all. They come in, they go out, they've got their entourage, they go in the dressing room. Sometimes I'm not even backstage, so it's not, it's not the same. And, and you, there's not a lot of chit-chatting. Like they're, they're backstage, they're there, they're preparing for the show. That's their safe zone. You don't talk to them. If they should start up a conversation with you, it's fine. Um, but typically, that doesn't really happen that much. <coughs> so much for showbiz. Yes, sir. Uh, since uh, Live Nation is now signing more and more exclusive deals with these artists, like Jay-Z, Shakira, Madonna, and all that, um, and labels themselves really need to do more concerts than sell records because there's no money in the record business, do you see yourself as a direct competitor against the labels and Universal, Sony, and Warner, that you could be one of the major music groups? Um, that's interesting. I think the, our relationship with labels the, as a promoter has definitely changed over the years. Um, because, to your point, the artists don't make any money with their, with records anymore. It's, it's all concerts. I don't. We still work pretty close together. Um, well, Artist Nation, you've outsourced it to the major labels. But, you know, as a local promoter, I don't have, you know, perhaps in the big, the big scheme of things, grand scheme of things, but, like, how that works with Madonna's deal and that, you know, after that X record, then Live Nation got it, I have no idea how any of that works. And most people who are on a promoter level don't. So if someone from, you know, Artist Nation or Rock Nation was here, they could probably tell you the dynamic of how that works. You know, are there revenue streams from that into Live Nation that would affect? Yes, but on a local promoter level, nobody would know that. So if we have a Madonna show or, you know, a Nickelback show or whatever, we don't know the dynamic of anything other than the actual concert. Right, maybe your position, but it, it just seems like Live Nation is getting so huge and taking over a lot of the concert places uh, that that the artists would rather almost be with a live nation because that's where they're going to make their revenue yeah. stream anyway oh, absolutely. than be with a label that yes. can't support them on tour. So I almost see you guys as closer to those big music Probably, groups you know, on, than, than you once were. Definitely than we once were. And I think depending on the artist, though, it'll continue to go in that direction. I'm actually surprised it hasn't happened more than it has to date. Because it, for a while there, there was a flurry of activity, and then it sort of stopped. It, there's not a lot uh, going on. So I don't know what that is. I don't know if it's easier just to focus on the management and the concert promotion, because that is where the money is primarily. And even like with the artist division, we've purchased different management companies. But they're still acting as their own. So it's still fairly separate. You know, Irving leaving, all of that, that changed the dynamic. But now they started up again under Guy Osiri. Yeah. So there's a whole management infrastructure uh, within the Live Nation organization of managers, a consortium of managers, whether it's um, G. Robson with uh, uh, Lil Wayne and Nicki Minaj, and um, so uh, Clarence Spaulding from Nashville. So they put together a whole consortium. It's unclear what that is going to do. And then you got to remember, when they started Live Nation Artists, they had hired Michael Cole mm. to run that division mm -hmm. out of Florida. He was staffing up with an entire infrastructure that was going to parallel what a record company did. And then somebody upstairs at Live Nation went, hold on a second. We're not going to do this. We're going to take these artists. 
we have revenue streams, some of them 360, and we're going to use the infrastructure that the labels have, license them that, and we're the, we're the brokers of the middleman. We're going to make money on the concerts, which the record companies have no entitlement to. We're going to share in the merch. Um, so I, I'm not sure how the publishing works, but with U2, the, basically U2 left Island Records and went with, live, went with Live Nation's Artist Nation division. So they got a, a boatload of money up front, and which they couldn't get from a label because the labels weren't in a position to do that. And so even with that YouTube sh that tour, I think I forget it was a ridiculous number of shows that had to play out before Live Nation saw a dime. Yeah. Yeah. The advance, right, and the that's advance. how they get it. That's how Live Nation started because SFX went out and bought up all these individual promoters by offering every artist more money than the smaller promoters could afford. So then they had all these promoters, and now what? And he turns around and sells it. And then, you know, we have to try to make this work. So the dynamic does change a bit. I think Live Nation is cautious, I would say, on some of the stuff now, but looking. You, but you look at what they've done, and it's international acts. So, you know, Shakira, Shakira. is a huge global artist. Yeah. U2, probably bigger in, in, in European countries than they are in the United States as of this moment. Nickelback is still a factor in Canada. So they, you know, have that situation there. And, who, and Madonna is still, again, probably bigger outside North America than she is here. So Live Nation is going to recoup their investment, and, you know, easily. And if they don't sell any CDs or music, it's oh well. Yeah. So I, I don't I don't see that as a risk, and I don't see them really in competition, because they're basically going right back. You know, okay, you left Island, but now you're with Interscope. So it's the same parent company, Universal Music. So. I, I don't know how that, I don't really see how that's competition per se. And now so the sales of CDs doesn't even necessarily translate to ticket it's sales. It's a lost leader. But yeah. So downloads perhaps, but um, look at somebody like the, the, the hottest show of the year probably is that Grateful Dead show in Chicago, which is not Live Nation, but. Peter Shapiro's doing that. In AEG. So that, look at that with Trey, hottest ticket, and you wouldn't, that's just that because of what, what it is. And I think that's what's happening more now, too. Yes, Professor. Yes. Uh, hi, hi, Donna. Um, hi. Professor Phil, first time in a long time. Love the show. Um, <laughs> you had mentioned earlier about uh, artists, and um, they have to get, like, Santana has to be on Q104.3 when he's in town, even though from a dollar and marketing perspective, that's not going to work for him. Who's, is that Carlos Santana making that call? Is that his agent? Is that the manager? And is there who's making that call? And is there any way to convince them you're, you're putting dollars in the wrong place and you should really be doing something else? Well, it's it's rarely the artist, as far as I know. You know, but I don't know because I'm working with either a management rep or an agent rep. And as it relates to Santana, I honestly think he probably should be on cue. But it it. Again, it could come from a variety of places. It could come from the promotion department saying, you're really not supporting this guy. Even by advertising on a radio station, because there's a quid pro quo there, possibly. Then you have the publicist who'd go, how are they promoting that show? Or you could have a manager. But a more savvy marketing person on the management team of the artist would say, you know, it really doesn't matter if we, by that time, that's not going to sell us any tickets. So it's really showboat. And it's a waste of money at times. That may not be the case with Carlos, but Carlos presents interesting other things because there's a, he has a whole Latin community. There's a Latin album out, you know, aside from the classic rock, and, and you know, he's got tracks with contemporary artists on his new album, so there might be, there might be some value in buying some scattered spots on a, on a contemporary pop station in addition to that. But it's no different than back in the, in the 70s and 80s where they'd, artists would walk by Sam Goody's window in Midtown Manhattan that was a record store, actually sold records called Sam Goody. And he'd go, you guys aren't behind my project. I didn't see one copy of my album in the window. And I, I remember where you had, I had to go running down to retail stores, because I knew the artists would go by, and make sure their poster, they made posters for the album cover, or get an empty album cover and put that in the window so when the artist walked by, or I was given specific directions, on your way to that radio station, make sure you walk by this particular retailer because we did a big display in the window and that would cost the record company money to do that. 
but it was all like knee jerk stuff that is because you saw the album in the window is that going to make you run in and say oh there's a new Emerson Lake and Palmer album I gotta buy that it just it didn't work that way but you have everybody who's you know you're in a business of stroking egos yeah and everybody's an expert especially in marketing so um, oh, yeah. to your point it, it depends you we can get we can get an artist manager or a marketing rep. Sometimes with the agents, it's an assistant who really doesn't know anything about marketing, which makes it really tricky. Um, but we can plead our case. We don't always win, but because it's New York, because it might be a little different um, with how to do things, we get different arguments, like use this digital company over this digital company, but we have a better track record because we control the data. So there's different conversations that we have now as opposed to should you be on radio, should you be in print, should you be on TV. Uh, and, and part of it, the strange dynamic of the industry is that we're providing the guarantee to the artist. It's our money that's the marketing budget for the most part, yet we can't do anything without their approval. So all of our money's on the line, yet we can't, we have to have their blessing to proceed. So certainly we'll argue when we can um, depending on what they mean they it's their artists too so if they know uh, we need to be on a Latin station or they respond well to a certain community and they share that information we certainly wouldn't dispute it sometimes it just gets into different arguments and it depends on how how much the person who's making these statements knows if it's and usually they do um, but I just got into a conversation about an EDM artist uh, who snipes versus digital. And if we did the, the wild postings on the street, we wouldn't have enough money for digital. And she was adamant about doing snipes, and I, we finally won and said, no, it needs to go on digital. So there, are, there is conversation. It's not like, no, this is what you need to do, because then why would we be there? Uh, there is an idea that most embrace that the local markets know their market better. There's a little, because it's New York, I think, like Taxi TV. LA loves Taxi TV. Any New Yorker knows that no one watches Taxi TV. Uh, but to, to, they, the, if, if the agent's getting in the cab to go to the hotel and sees the spot, it's amazing. So. But yet you have Pandora doing a deal with uh, Uber. Never know. And it cha everything changes so quickly with all this stuff that yeah. you just kind of have to follow it. And that goes back to you know, knowing, thinking outside the box and, and keeping up on what's current because that'll help you be a better marketer or a better anything. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, so the other day I just bought uh, ACDC tickets. Ah. They were on sale. And... Um, I don't know if it's sold out yet for MetLife. I'm not sure if it's it sold out yet. It didn't sell out yet, but it sold well. Yeah, and I saw um, like some TV ads and stuff like that, but I was wondering if there's anything in particular you guys did for that that you maybe didn't do for other artists or something the, along those lines. The, well, we, it was bigger. It was a bigger launch. I want to say the ACDC budget was $200,000, which is a big ad budget, okay. one of the bigger ones. Um, <clears throat> when we have a lot of times on a show like that, we'll try to do something that's – Jay-Z, Beyonce, any of those where we're doing like wall projections or we're doing some sort of billboard takeover, something that's a little splashier. I think with ACDC, we relied a little bit more on traditional media. We did run some print ads because you have to know the, obviously the audience. So it's interesting to see. You bought a ticket and yeah. I'm sure there's um, a lot of the audience, 55 plus, who bought a ticket to see ACDC. Yeah. So, and to your point, we have to make sure we hit every end of that spectrum. So it was a mix of digital, but also a lot of traditional media. Um, because it's in New Jersey, we, we use billboards a lot more, um, even though our company will tell us that statistically outdoor doesn't perform well. But there's another anomaly for New York City because people are outside way more in New York than they are elsewhere. So we'll buy their subway platforms and we'll do all that stuff that's a, that wouldn't be done for every show based on, if we know it's a commuter show, we'll go around Penn Station heavier. So if, if we have high sales from New Jersey or Long Island, we'll hit those commuter points. So all those things come into play, um, but on a show like that that really spans the decades, we have to make sure we hit every part of it. 
And thankfully, we had the budget to do it. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so coming to closing time, and this is an appropriate question because I, I promised Donna I'd let her, you know, after her long work day, giving us all this time, be able to get out of here at a reasonable time. So this question is from, Ger I think it's Gerbert Martinez. Appropriate question at this hour. How many times have you thought about quitting? Oh my God, today? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Uh, a lot, several times, and for different reasons. Um, but I don't know that I, there's probably been a few times where I was sort of serious. Um, you know, it's because it's a, it's a passionate business, it's a, it's a discerning uh, part of the piece of the puzzle where it's, we're easily blamed. Um, it's, it can be a little discouraging. And at the end of the day, though, I still don't know that I could do anything else. And I don't, it, I always thought if looking back, I had no regrets, I knew I made all the right decisions. And looking back, sitting here, even regardless of how many times I've thought about what else I would do or why else I would do it, I don't have a single regret. Um, you know, I, when I came down to New York, I had just bought a condo. I lived in it for three months brand new, and now somebody else is living, it, living in it. And everyone thought I was insane to give everything up. I had a very comfortable position. Um, but I knew that would be my regret. I knew that I couldn't live the rest of my life thinking about, oh, I wonder what it would have been like to work in New York City. And, you know, it worked out, thankfully. But um, I think with any job, you probably, there's discouraging days. And there's, thankfully, it's never been so bad where I, I couldn't take it. There were a couple of days in the beginning with Ron Delsner when he would scream at me, and I wasn't even sure that what hit me, um, that I didn't know that I could continue. And, or wanted to, because there's, it's, can you and want, do you want to? So, like, to what end? Do you want to work 12-hour days? Do you want to have sometimes six, seven work days in a row? And then you go to the show and you have a blast and you think, oh, yeah, you know what? I do want to do this. Or you stand behind an audience who's absolutely loving it and you see an expression on someone's face and they're having the time of their life and you've just improved their minute for, uh, that you helped. That makes it worth it. So no regrets. Um, I guess I'll know when it's time to go. Um, before, hopefully it's before somebody decides it is, but um, the, no regrets. And even though some days are, I can't wait to get out, it's still, I still never have a problem in the morning walking out the door. That's a good thing. It's not everybody can say that. No, nope, it's true. So that's or a good I'm thing. I'm a glutton for punishment, I'm not sure. Mm, I don't think so. Anyway, I want to thank Donna for coming down tonight. Thank you.